degrees. Let's say in this scenario you got 10 degrees of superheat. Uh, your your suction line coming off the evaporator is going to be about 50 degrees if you measure it with a thermometer. You got a 50 degree suction line coming off the evaporator. You got a 40 degree saturated vapor temperature. How do you know that? By your pressure. Now look at your suction pressure, convert it to temperature, which they do that for you on the pressure entropy diagram. And so you know that you've got, um, you know, you, you've got 10 degrees of superheat. It's not, not really hard to figure out. Uh, if you'll also notice, um, the real, the net refrigeration effect occurs from that 75% liquid to the point of saturation. And that's the net refrigeration effect. That's what you absorb from your conditioned space. And of course, that heat's going to be rejected, but you can measure it. You know, you can measure where if you start here at 60, and let's say we go to, uh, you know, 100, a little over 100, you got about 40 BTU per pound. Uh, uh, 40 BTU per pound of refrigerant in that scenario. And, um, now that's, that's just an example of how we use the pressure entropy diagram. And you're always going to have this odd looking box. Uh, and you can also, you know, look at your other things here. Uh, you know, the, um, your, um, you know, your, your uh, volume, your entropy. What's entropy? It's a ratio of your uh, cubic feet and the amount of heat in, in that particular amount of refrigerant uh, and that's going to be occurring in the evaporator. Any questions so far? Is that helping you understand that a little bit better? It did. I just I more or less just wanted to get the concept uh, and hearing you explain it differently kind of reinforced what I read and what it, you know um, it makes a little bit more sense now. So okay good. All right we'll move on to the next chart and then they see the thing about the pressure entropy diagram it's a graphical representation of what's happening in that refrigeration system. You got your compressor, you got your vapor coming in, and it pumps the vapor up to a high pressure, you got your vapor leaving. And remember, the compressor is a vapor pump. If for some reason you have a malfunction over here on this side and you get liquid back to that compressor, that's bad news. That's called liquid slugging, and that's a common cause of compressor failure. But you got your uh, compressor, your discharge line, your condenser, metering device, your evaporator, and your suction line. Those are your seven basic components. Um, and what does the condenser do? It rejects heat out of the refrigerant, changes the refrigerant back to the liquid. They show a little liquid receiver here. Uh, you got 100% liquid entering the metering device. And remember, uh, it, this is where you have that little funny looking box on that pressure entropy diagram. It happens right here. Uh, and then you have a, a drastic drop in uh, pressure and temperature in the metering device. The temperature of the refrigerant is lower, and then you got about 75% liquid remaining, and then you got about 25% vapor. And that 25% is what it costs to lower the temperature of that refrigerant um, as you lower the pressure in that refrigerant pass through that metering device. Now this 75% liquid is what does the remainder of the work. That's where your real net refrigeration effect occurs. As that liquid's boiling off, it's absorbing heat from the air uh, blowing across that evaporator. If this is a water chiller, it's absorbing heat from the water that's passing through that, uh, that evaporator. Uh, and then that 75% does the remainder of the work. And somewhere right in here is your point of saturation. That's, that's your 100% liquid. I'm sorry. Vapor? Thank you. <laughs> There's a lot to this, and sometimes it, and I get to talking fast, and I will get, get vapor and liquid mixed up, but I don't mean to. Thanks for correcting me. But that's 100% uh, vapor. Uh, and then once it becomes 100% vapor, guess what? It's still 40 degrees. And if your air or surrounding ambient temperature is warmer than that, uh, it's, that, that vapor is going to absorb additional heat, and that's our super. Superheat's a good thing. What's the value of superheat? Number one, it ensures you got 100% vapor entering your compressor. You don't have to worry about liquid. If you've got some superheat, you 
you've got 100% vapor leaving your evaporator and entering your compressor. Also, uh, that superheat is a measure of how active this evaporator is. Do you have uh, this ratio, which is normal, uh, it, is that evaporator efficient as it can be? Let's say, for example, you got some um, condenser problems or you got a low charge, and let's say that you don't have 100% liquid entering the metering device here. Let's say that you've got 80% uh, liquid. All right, well, that's going to change this ratio. Uh, you might have 60% uh, liquid and 40% vapor to begin with. All right, so you don't have enough liquid, your evaporator is going to be starving. So you're going to get that saturation point somewhere up here, and you're going to have a lot of superheat. So what's a lot of superheat? It means you got problems. You got a, you know, you got a really heavy load. You got a high load on your evaporator. You got a low charge. You got, um, you know, you got condenser problems. You got refrigerant problems. You got metering device problems. You got a starving evaporator. You know, you got a typical superheat in refrigeration averages. Um, anywhere from 10 to 20 degrees. That's a, a good rule of thumb. You know, on a hot day, a really hot day, uh, you know, on an older system, you might have 20 degrees of superheat. Uh, if, if you've got 30 degrees of superheat, you got problems as a general rule. David, you got anything you want to add to that? Oh, you're doing, you're doing great. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's, you know, that's, that's something that you can use the pressure entropy diagram for is, is to help you understand you know what's happening in the refrigeration system and you can measure how much heat each pound of refrigerant is removed. So that's a good tool, especially if you're an engineer. Now we do cover some engineering concepts. I mean here's another example. You know and it shows uh, this is uh, this is the evaporator. This is where that 75% does its work. All right, this is your point of saturation. From here to here, there's no real net refrigeration effect. Uh, this is your superheat region. Now, the superheat is important and you need it, but it doesn't add to the, the uh, efficiency of the system. It, it's just something that you gotta have. Uh, it's important, you know, you gotta have that superheat. All right, up here on your condenser part, there's a couple of other sources of heat that's added to that vapor that has to be, uh, heat has to be removed. Uh, all right, that's your compressor section. Um, and you know, you've got some additional heat here that's, that, see, this is, all, this is all the heat that was removed from the conditioned space. What's all this here? You know, where'd all that heat come from? It came from the superheat that was absorbed in the vapor uh, on your low pressure side as the refrigerant became 100% saturated and made its way back to the compressor. All right, you've also got heat of compression. When you, how many of you, if you have a pneumatic air compressor at your house, you pump your tires up with or you know work around your shop with? Uh, you ever fell to that discharge line coming off that compressor? It's hot. All right, that's a natural phenomenon. When you compress vapor, you add heat to it. Now that's how a diesel engine works. A diesel engine has to have a lot more compression in that cylinder than a gasoline engine because, you know, as that fuel is atomized, you got a natural explosion. I mean, you know, it just, it's, uh, you know, you got that. There's heat already there. Just the the fact of that com compressed fuel, uh, it's it's got heat and it's ready to to do its thing. I mean, you know, I I love physics. I just wish I knew more about it. <laughs> But uh, you've got the heat from the compressor motor and you've got the heat of compression. That's additional heat that has to be uh, rejected over here in the condenser. Um, so that, that's something that you can actually measure. You can measure your heat of rejection. You can figure out how much heat is being added by heat of compression and heat from the compressor motor. Now I will say that's not a normal measure. David was talking earlier about you know the measurements that you need to make a, a you know a good assessment when you're doing troubleshooting on a refrigeration system. That's not a normal measure. But however, if you've got a system that's causing some problems or not functioning properly, uh, you may actually need to to measure that. How are you going to measure? The only way I know to measure that is with a pressure entropy diagram. Do you know of another way, David, to oh, actually measure the heat of compression? No, it, it, you would 
probably the, one of the biggest things that you do out in the field would be look at your discharge temperature. That we usually indicate whether or not you have a high superheat coming in from the but plus you may actually have a cylinder or something that's not pumping correctly and recycling the gas back in itself. But 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 uh, you know the pressure enthalpy diagram is not something that you would see a lot in the field. But if you know some basic concepts and why it's important and you know what you can do with it, uh, and that's that's what happens in your condenser. Again, you know look at look at that additional. Uh, look, look at the additional heat that was added. This is your the heat that was rejected, uh, you know, from the conditioned space. This heat here is from the heat of compression and heat from your compressor motor. Um, metering device, you know, that's where the refrigerant enters the metering device. And if you notice pressure changes, temperature changes, no, uh, there's no enthalpy, uh, no net refrigeration effect that occurs that can be measured. And again, you got your your refrigeration components. Uh, if you understand the basic vapor compression refrigeration cycle, you can understand the pressure entropy diagram. Um, that's it. Do you guys got any questions? Did that help you? It was a lot easier having you explain it than you just, I read the PowerPoints, but I didn't know what I was looking at. Okay. So you broke it down more in layman's terms for us to understand what I was looking at. Because um, I already understood the seven, you know, the seven principles and how, how they applied, but putting them in that graph, you know, helped me out anyway. We're good. All right.